The level of success of integration can be measured using numerous criteria, but this unit will explore the extent of cultural and political impact of our selected ethnic groups. Let us first examine some general observations from British society. Ethnic minorities in Britain live in substantially poorer housing conditions than whites, according to Blackstone et al. And 20% of Bangladeshis in Britain are living in overcrowded housing compared to 0.4% of the white population. There are also significant differences within and among ethnic groups, illustrated by the relatively high mobility and success of Chinese and Indian groups in Britain compared to the disadvantaged West Indians, Pakistanis and Bangladeshis in Britain. When it comes to education, Chinese, Asian and Indian Britons tend to be better qualified than British born whites, but the former are still more likely to be employed in inferior positions to British born whites with similar qualifications. White and West Indian Britons are less likely to aim for universities than other groups, but compared to the national population, Chinese, Black and Indians are overrepresented at universities, whereas Bangladeshis are underrepresented and Pakistanis are on the border of being underrepresented at universities in Britain. In terms of labor, unemployment is more than three times the national average among Black, Pakistani and Bangladeshi Britons and these groups are overrepresented in semi-skilled or unskilled manual work. Again, significant differences within and among ethnic groups must be pointed out. Quote, Insofar as there is a fundamental divide in employment by ethnicity, it is not a black and white divide, but a divide between white, Chinese, African Asian and Indian men on the one hand, and Bangladeshi, Pakistani and Caribbean men on the other, unquote. In other words, the differences among ethnic minorities in employment are just as important to explore as comparisons to the white British population. What are some of the reasons for these disproportionate figures on housing, education and employment? What do these figures say about integration in Britain? We are now moving on to an examination of the first of our selected ethnic groups, West Indians in Britain, also called Black Britons. A number of crucial changes were sweeping through Britain in the 1950s. All of them were important to the future of the migrants. The great industrial task had been to redirect the factories which had been geared up to produce weapons and other equipment of war. This was swiftly achieved in the few years after the war. Another great transformation was the dismantling of the British Empire in Africa and the Caribbean. It was a time of dramatic and far-reaching change, which provoked anxiety and insecurity in British society as a whole. There were intense social tensions, which were partly to do with the pressures of life in the decaying inner cities. During this time, the tone of relationships between the migrants and the rest of society was influenced or even dictated by the competition for housing. This was a central element in the 1958 race riots, which put race and immigration at the forefront of public consciousness. The end of the war had left the major British cities with a severely reduced and run-down housing stock, and this shortfall was one of the politicians' constant preoccupations. A great deal of council housing was being constructed, but council tenancies were decided by length of residence, so for most migrants, private housing was the only alternative. But before 1961, there was no legislation against racial discrimination, and it was routine to see notices of rented accommodation prefaced by the words, no colors. The migrants found themselves being hemmed in within inner city areas which were already decaying and paying exorbitant rents for substandard accommodation. But the experience did not discourage other migrants but they really could not know how far this first obstacle would limit their potential and daily life was often characterized by insecurity. By the 1970s, the Caribbean migrants had become an established group and many had had children since arriving in Britain. As a result, the community began a new engagement with local politics and with promoting the sort of services needed in bringing up a family. 
The first black counselors, magistrates, and even mayors followed in the footsteps of the first well-known migrant politician, Lord Pitt. A new generation grew up and went to school in Britain, started their careers, and were later instrumental in creating the present shape of black British identity. Among them were figures like Diane Abbott, Baroness Amos, Bernie Grant, Russell Prophet, and Lenny Henry. Equally important were grassroots campaigns such as the Black Parents Movement, which was founded to combat the overrepresentation of black children in educationally subnormal schools, ESN, and went on to fight the SUS laws. SUS laws allowed the police to stop and search so called suspected persons and were largely used against young black people. In addition, there was a wave of self help projects, supplementary schools, hostels for homeless young people, and youth clubs. During the 1970s, the black community began to treat black culture as something more than a way of collecting together black influences from various parts of the world. Writers, actors, musicians, and artists were marrying their Caribbean background to the migrants' experiences in Britain. Whether or not they intended it, the result was an outline of a new identity, which could only be described as black and British. Part of the common ground young black people found was in the experience of discrimination and exclusion. They began to identify themselves by their response to this experience rather than by the national identity of their parents. This response produced music, clubs, a language and a style which had elements of the Caribbean, but which was largely about conditions in Britain. The second generation of West Indians in Britain began to see themselves as uniquely different to their parents. For Caribbeans, this was a new way of seeing their identity, in terms of race and the circumstances of life, rather than in terms of their national background. And it was an attitude which gradually filtered back from the younger generation to their parents. By the start of the 1980s, Older Caribbeans, who had started out as Jamaicans or Trinidadians, were reassessing both their identity and their role in Britain. The Death Turk Fire took place in January 1981. A group of young black people were caught in a burning house during a party and 13 of them died. Many people believed it to have been a racist crime, partly because the district was a hotbed of National Front activity. Anger mounted when, a few weeks later, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher offered instant condolences to the victims of another fire at a disco in Dublin. In contrast, she had been completely silent after Deptford. The difference in the official response reinforced the indignation felt within the black community, and the Deptford fire became a symbol of all the injuries the black migrants and their children had sustained in the past. The campaign which followed prompted a massive demonstration called the Black People's Day of Action. The slogan which summed up the mood of the march came from a poem by Linton Queasy Johnson, Come What May, We're Here to Stay. Reactions to the Deptford Fire were also an element in the 1980s race riots. The riots of the 1980s were paralleled and followed by a political trend which produced a number of successful black councillors. In general, local government provided a wider doorway of opportunity for the migrants than national elections. In May 1981, the first black county councillors were elected to the Greater London and West Midlands councils. These successes were the tip of an iceberg. Black people involved both in local and national party politics had already drawn up an agenda for action against discrimination in local government employment and housing. In addition, they fought for ideas such as contract compliance, referring to equal opportunity in the firms contracted by local authorities. The GLC and other large municipalities influenced by this agenda promoted the importance of changing the economic and social position of black and Asian citizens. The prominent part played by black and Asian counselors and advisors also changed attitudes among both whites and blacks about the potential of black politicians. At the other end of the scale, there was a dramatic increase in the numbers of black trade union members, school governors, and magistrates.
The powers of local government declined steadily during Thatcher's term in office, and when the GLC was abolished, it was regarded as the end of a period of official benevolence towards the black community. But there had been various changes in both the style and content of Caribbean migrant identity. Black culture had become a marker of black identity, and its popularity and inclusiveness began to open doors which were previously closed to black people. It also meant that institutions had to start focusing on the special needs and requirements of black communities. Still, the avenues to success for black people were strictly limited by discrimination. There was only one capital asset that black people possessed which was clearly marketable. Their new identity exemplified by their culture and music. Black people became enthusiastic participants in the expansion of cultural industries. Musicians like Jazzy B became international figures and also created an economic and social base for other black musicians. Entrepreneurs began establishing businesses based on the black community. Throughout the 1980s, they created and marketed a wide variety of enterprises based on services to black people in Britain, from travel agents to black publications or in areas where there were easy opportunities within the culture, such as athletics or music. Over the past few decades, the Caribbean community has had a huge impact on many aspects of British life. In 1987, the first MPs from the Caribbean community were elected to Parliament. British music owes a lot to Caribbean musicians and DJs like Eddie Grant, Soul to Soul and Goldie. The world of sport has also benefited from Caribbean people within the sports industry. Linford Christie and Tessa Sanderson, the first Caribbean to win an Olympic gold for Britain in 1984, became famous athletes. Rio Ferdinand and Aaron Lennon played football for England. Viv Anderson was the first black footballer to play for England in 1978 and a survey carried out in 2004 revealed that over 20% of players in the English Premier League were of Caribbean descent. British literature has also been enriched by writers and poets such as Sadie Smith and Benjamin Sevenaya. Let us move on to experiences of Asians in Britain. The Asian community in Britain has had a huge impact on the British way of life. Many of the small shops on Britain's streets are run by Asian families, and Indian food is now enjoyed by just about everybody in Britain. Many cities also have large mosques and Hindu temples where Asian people worship. The Muslim festival of Eid is celebrated in London's Trafalgar Square, and the Mila festival in Leicester is a chance for British Hindus to celebrate their faith. On the other hand, disturbances in 2001 on the streets of cities with Asian populations, mostly in Burnley, Oldham and Bradford, demonstrated the negative experiences of the Asian minority in Britain. Please read the article by Tim Ross in your course compendium. What do you consider some of the main reasons for the situation for Black and Asian Britons, as described in this Telegraph article? What is the most appropriate and effective way for society to handle such situations? How far should society go in creating equality pertaining to political representation? In a 2005 survey conducted by the now defunct Commission for Racial Equality, respondents were asked about the meaning of success within British society and a list of successful Britons was generated as a result of responses. All the data sources showed that success in the public sphere was associated with five main areas sports, business, entertainment, politics, and science and technology. Generally, white participants thought of a broader range of successful Britons than ethnic minority participants. White participants were also much more likely to include prominent figures from the past than ethnic minority participants. They were also the only group to consider inventors and scientists as successful Britons. While white participants did not spontaneously mention people from ethnic minority backgrounds in their list of successful Britons, 
Once prompted, they came up with the names of many successful Britons from ethnic minorities. South Asian participants could only think of one successful Asian sportsman, Amir Khan, one successful Asian businessman, Sharon Dill, and one successful Asian politician, Muhammad Sarwar. There seemed to be a generation and gender divide too among the South Asian participants, with older participants being more likely to identify political figures than younger ones and than women in general. Black Caribbean and Black African participants reproduced a long list of Black sports people, but only two Black politicians, and a number of prominent figures in the entertainment, music, and media industries. Take a look at this reproduction of the CRE's Table 2 Successful Britons by Field and Ethnic Group. This table lists responses according to ethnic groups and their perceptions of successful Britons. It's obvious that preferences vary according to ethnicity. For instance, South Asians listing Seattle and Bhaskar as successful entertainers, and Black Britons listing comedian, comedian Henry and McDonnell, the first Black British news anchor, which differs from the other two groups of respondents. However, the table also illustrates that the British majority has to an extent embraced successful Britons from the ethnic minorities such as the boxers of ethnic origin, Eubank, Nassim, and Khan, and other black athletes listed by white respondents. Sarwar and Al-Fayed are from the Middle East and are both listed as successful Britons by white respondents due to being an MP and the owner of Harrods, respectively. In other words, ethnic minorities have become part of British measures for success, indicating that integration has taken significant steps. Can you think of other successful Britons from ethnic minorities? We are now moving on to U.S. ethnic groups, the first of which are Irish Americans. Historians disagree on the position of Irish Americans, with Kirby Miller, for instance, painting a harsh picture of their experiences in the U.S. Quote, in spite of the diminutive size of their homeland, the Irish played an important role in the commercial and industrial revolutions that transformed the North Atlantic world. However, that role was ambiguous, turbulent, even tragic for the Irish who made no easy accommodation to the changing conditions that buffeted them both at home and in North America." Unquote. Other historians paint a more hopeful picture of triumph, but still recognizing the hardships the Irish endured, such as Lawrence McCaffrey. The fact that 20th century descendants of 19th century tenant farmers and agricultural laborers have become university professors, elementary and secondary school teachers, distinguished novelists, playwrights and poets, important figures on stage and screen, physicians, political leaders and corporation executives, classifies the Irish American Catholic experience as a tremendous success story. The Irish Catholic journey from ghetto to suburbs from despised aliens to valued members of the community, has been arduous, but in historical time, relatively brief. Less than three generations after the famine washed hundreds of thousands of unwanted human refuse onto the American shore, Irish Catholics controlled the Catholic Church, most of the major cities, and a large portion of the organized labor movement in the United States. There are indeed numerous influential Americans with Irish ancestry such as Billy the Kid, Timothy Leary, Spencer Tracy, Mary Harry's Mother Jones, John C. Calhoun, Peggy Noonan, Philip Sheridan, Cardinal Spellman, Charles Carroll of Carrollton, Sam Houston, Margaret Burke White, John McGraw, and Dennis Leary. Many of the firefighters who died in New York City on September 11, 2001, also traced their ancestry back to Ireland. Ed Sullivan, newspaper columnist and host of the television variety show that introduced Elvis and the Beatles to America, is also of Irish origin. Presidents Andrew Jack Jackson, Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, Woodrow Wilson, James Buchanan, and John F. Kennedy also have ancestors who emigrated from Ireland. Timothy Meagher notes that, quote, Irish Americans did not just passively adopt the American culture of their day. They helped make it. 
Second generation Irish, for example, played a critical role in forging the new American urban popular culture of the late 19th century, the culture of professional sports and vaudeville. Children of Irish immigrants, like the baseball player and manager John McGraw, or the singer Maggie Klein, not Yankee Blue Bloods from Boston's Back Bay or Anglo-Saxon Protestant farmers from the Kansas Plains, made this new but very American popular culture. Moving on to the experiences of Chinese Americans. The enactment of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 is a central example of the experiences of this minority in the U.S. In the first few years after the gold rush in the early 1850s, the Chinese had received a warm welcome on the West Coast, and the governor of California in 1852, seeking new sources of labor for the state, for instance, described the Chinese as, quote, the most worthy of our newly adopted citizens, unquote. However, this attitude to the Chinese soon changed, and the Chinese Exclusion Act was the culmination of a vigorous West Coast campaign against the Chinese. As Dinerstein et al. explained, quote, the negative picture of the Chinese originated before they came to America, with American missionaries, merchants, and diplomats who had sent back derogatory pictures of China and the Chinese. At first, these images were not widely known. Nevertheless, they did prepare public opinion for the growing hostility toward Asians, especially as immigrants from Asia increased from approximately 40,000 in 1860 to over 100,000 in 1880. Most West Coast workers, whether native or foreign-born, claimed that these people depressed wages and consequently provoked unfair competition, unquote. When fewer jobs became available in the West, especially when the railroad was completed and the subsequent depression took effect in the 1870s. Anti-Chinese attitudes became widespread on the West Coast, and a legislative committee of California was appointed in 1876 to investigate the Chinese in the States. This committee con concluded that, quote, the Chinese are inferior to any race God ever made. They have no souls to save, and if they have, they are not worth saving." Unquote. The Chinese were accused of having low morals, especially concerning prostitution and smoking opium, of low health standards and corruption, and the subsequent campaign in the West demanded a ban on Chinese immigration. These sentiments were based on a vast cultural differences between the Chinese and Americans but also on racist views on Asians. Due to these sentiments, Chinese settlers in the U.S. naturally faced discrimination. Dinerstein et al. explained, quote, mobs assaulted them, legislatures burdened them with special head taxes, and city ordinances harassed their hotels and laundries, unquote. One of the most vigorous opponents of Chinese immigration was Dennis Kearney and the Working Men's Party in the 1870s. The group produced a manifesto stating that, quote, the Chinaman must leave our shores. We declare that white men and women and boys and girls cannot live as the people of the great republic should and compete with a single Chinese coolie in the labor market. To an American, death is preferable to life on a par with the Chinaman, unquote. In addition to the bans on Chinese immigration, the already settled Chinese newcomers faced widespread discrimination in jobs and housing after 1890, and the media frequently produced derogatory images of Chinese Americans. After the Second World War, there was a substantial decline in racial prejudice in the U.S., producing, among other things, new legislation regarding immigration and citizenship and a growing civil rights movement focusing on equality regardless of ethnicity. As Dinerstein et al. observe, while Chinese and Japanese immigrants had been scorned and were the first ethnic groups to be banned, they found growing acceptance in post-World War II America. Educational and employment opportunities began to open up for their children, and by the middle of the 1960s, many state legislatures had outlawed racial discrimination. The most far-reaching of these measures came at the height of the civil rights movement, 
In 1964, Congress banned discrimination in public accommodations, education, and employment. It then passed the Voting Rights Act of 1965, permitting all adult Americans to register to vote. There are several reasons for this decline in racial prejudice, according to Dinnerstein et al. The fear of divided loyalties that was so potent in World War I, and to a lesser extent in World War II, did not materialize during the Cold War. Prejudice is also strongly correlated with levels of income, religious intensity, and education. As incomes and education increased, and as religion became less of a commitment and more of a social identification, tolerance grew. Education did not guarantee the end of prejudice, but there is no doubt that rising levels served to dampen the fires of bigotry. A highly educated public seemed more willing to accept ethnic differences. At the same time, minority members of European and Asian groups absorbed the dominant values of society as they went through the public schools, state colleges, and universities. Finally, as a result of the immigration laws of the 1920s, the nation had achieved a general balance of ethnic groups. The fears of old stock Americans that hordes of aliens might undermine American traditions and destroy existing institutions declined. The foreign-born percentage of the population steadily decreased from about one-seventh in the 1920s to less than one-twentieth by the 1970s. America was becoming a more homogenized nation as the grandchildren of Asian and European immigrants came to be indistinguishable from one another, or indeed from those whose ancestors came to the U.S. before the American Revolution. With the renewed waves of Asian immigration after 1965, this group of newcomers became even more diverse, and anti-Asian sentiments rose again in the 1980s. However, these sentiments were not directed primarily towards the Chinese, but towards newcomers from other Asian nations such as Vietnamese and Korean immigrants. Still, the growing anti-Asian sentiments did have an impact on the Chinese as well, such as the fact that, quote, there was a 62% increase in anti-Asian incidents from 1984 to 1985. In Los Angeles County in 1986, violence against Asians accounted for half of the racial incidents compared to only 15% of the year before, unquote. There was a significant change for the Chinese-American community after the Second World War, largely due to declining prejudice, but also factors within the community itself. Quote, a strong family system, a commitment to education, and hard work, unquote, are mentioned as crucial in, the, in transforming the conditions for Chinese-Americans. As Dinnerstein et al. describe, by 1960, many Chinese had moved into the middle class, they shunned jobs in laundries and other undesirable forms of employment in favor of technical and professional occupations. Particularly in mathematics and science, the Chinese made a name for themselves. Several won Nobel Prizes, among them Chen Ning Yang and Xing Dao Li. Veneration for learning and scholarship was revealed by the fact that by the 1960s, proportionately more Chinese than Caucasians had completed college. Towards the end of the 20th century, Chinese Americans generally earned more than most other Americans, and they were well represented in professional occupations. Still, Chinese Americans complain that there is a glass ceiling in the American business market, preventing them from getting the top jobs. In terms of politics, however, it was hard for Chinese Americans to build a political base due to the relatively small population in the U.S. Consequently, politics was not a common way up the social ladder, but in Hawaii, with its large Chinese population, the chances were better. After the 1980s, Chinese Americans and Asian Americans in general started to win elective office, such as Gary Locke's success successful run for governor of Washington in 1996. Despite the ethnic mobility and relative success of Chinese Americans, there are still many working class and poor Chinese in American Chinatowns. Asian Americans have been referred to as the model minority, which has been problematic for individuals experiencing difficulties and discrimination. There are significant
class and ethnic divisions among Asian Americans, which comprise many groups with diverse cultures, education, and income levels. We are now moving on to an examination of Muslim Americans. The 9-11 attacks made it even more difficult for Muslim Americans, and especially those of Arab origins, to gain influence in the U.S. However, interfaith dialogue has increased since then, and the 9-11 attacks helped galvanize the Muslim American community to become more active in civic and political activities, to advocate for issues of concern, to build alliances with non-Muslim organizations, and to confront intolerance and the threats of violence. According to Nafis Sayed at the Harvard University, quote, active engagement and involvement in politics reflects the fact that American Muslims are part of the social fabric of America and also reflect their patriotic concern for this country, unquote. Some key developments regarding the political and cultural impact of Muslim Americans are Charles Bilal was elected mayor of Kunsit, Texas in 1991 and became the first Muslim to head a U.S. municipality. In 1993, the U.S. Army appointed its first Muslim chaplain. In 1996, the first celebration of Eid al-Fitr was held at the White House. In 2001, the U.S. Postal Service issued the first stamp honoring a Muslim holiday, the 34-cent Eid stamp, as part of its holiday celebration series. In 2005, the first Muslim national sorority in the U.S., Gamma Gamma Chi, was founded to help improve the image of Muslim women and Islam in general. And Keith Ellison became the first Muslim elected to the U.S. Congress in 2006, taking his seat in the House of Representatives for Minnesota. Some well-known American Muslims are Fareed Zechariah, editor of Newsweek International Magazine and a host on CNN, Boxer Muhammad Ali and basketball player Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Rapper and actor Mos Def. Singer-songwriter Everlast. And comedians Dave Chappelle, Master Brawny and Asif Mandwi. Some commentators now argue that Muslim American literature can be legitimately considered a distinct genre through works such as The Autobiography of Malcolm X and Khaled Hosseini's The Kite Runner. Please read Muslims in America, a statistical portrait by the U.S. Department of State in your compendium. What can you learn about the cultural and political integration of Muslim Americans from this text? To what extent was this surprising information compared to widely held perceptions of this group? And finally, can you think of successful Americans from ethnic minorities not mentioned in this unit?